Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Coulson. Um, brief background on who I am and why I get to stand up here and talk to all of you for the next hour or so. Um, so I'm the co-founder of Reserve. We're a, intending to be a decentralized stablecoin company. Um, uh, brief background on myself, so I studied a mixture of economics and computer science and uh, math at UPenn before I dropped out. Um, spent three years working at a startup incubator, <coughs> sort of weird institution, half training founders, half psychology research institute. Um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, um, catch me out there. It's very interesting, but I'm not talking about that today. Um, uh, Reserve is the sort of first large company that's spinning out of that uh, company incubator paradigm. Um, and so I was part of the initial team that spun out to <coughs> found Reserve. Um, I've been the lead protocol designer at Reserve for the last year. I'm just basically focusing on how to do decentralized mechanism design, looking at all the different attempts people are making in the space, mostly awarded in my opinion. Um, and uh, trying to figure out what approaches seem credible, what approaches seem not credible, and how we can sort of navigate that whole thing. Um, it's probably right to think of me as like knowledgeable enough about a lot of different topics to not sound stupid, um, and not a intense expert in one particular thing. But I think that that's actually benefited uh, the sort of mechanism design challenge quite well, because uh, there are a lot of different types of mistakes that you can make when you're trying to do that sort of thing. Um, so that's a little bit of background on myself. Um, briefly on Reserve, for those of you that don't know much about Reserve, so as I mentioned, we're a decentralized stable line company based in Oakland, California. We have like 24 people on our team right now. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> uh, uh, haven't eaten for a while, so I'm just gonna pizza right now. Um, uh, yeah, other things. Um, random credibility signaling is that we're funded by Peter Thiel and Sam Altman and um, Coinbase. Um, sorry, sorry. Uh, oh yeah, and in, in the cryptocurrency space, I would say we're maybe most well known for writing long technical blog posts about why other people's ideas are bad. Um, so if you haven't seen our blog, um, we have long analysis of basis and make it out, and also some general thoughts on different things. Um, so definitely recommend checking it out if you have it. Um, okay, so intro's out of the way. Oh, and by the way, this is sort of an outline of my talk so you can follow along. What is happening in case you zone out at any point? Um, so, before I dive into content, um, I want to get a little bit of a sense of why people are here. Um, let's get that. Like, what sorts of things are you interested, interested in? Is it stable point in particular? Were you forced to come because you're part of the club? I know I've been student groups in the past myself. Um, uh, yeah, but, so uh, I'm just interested if people can sort of popcorn a few things about why you're, just so as I talk about different things, um, I can try to sort of render it as interesting and exciting. I think stable, well, stable points is an interesting area, mm -hmm. uh, especially when compared to the central bank issue coins. So yeah. here to listen to what you have to say. In what stable means. <laughs> That's a good question. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, to me, it's an mixed norma between the block, you know, the decentralized technologies and stable coin because the stable coin is always attached to something. That's something I will get into. I'm sorry? That's something I will get into. I hope. Yeah. Is a little bit better? No, no, no. no wait, the question was. Oh, oh, yeah. The question, yeah. The question was um, uh, advantages of stable coins compared to Bitcoin. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I guess how stable coins, or just like the idea of, I guess, relative to the government, how that kind of like plugs into government. Whether or not fiat, like 
to get fiat back by the dad that you know the nation state owes to like other nation states and stuff. But like taking that debt and then it's giving of itself back by the people who whose land it is like major kind of like by default pay or denominated in said like fiat things and then like I guess governance and whether or not there are like public policy things that we can kind of like learn from, whether or not like stable coins you need to kind of like either grow a community that is that accepts like um payment or, or like a service brand or whatever in said stable coin in order to kind of like detach itself from whatever fiat like it starts from is like where things kind of like grow. Yeah. The the general topic of the long run possibilities of stable coins is Super interesting and I'll add to Hugo's point, it's what, what well, exactly what the state will mean, who would you the right or who, well, or who is going to take what that price is relative to other currencies, mm -hmm. and it is a committee or a group of users, be that a selective group, who gives them the monetary authority to, to make those monetary decisions in terms of changing um, yeah. Yeah. Long term possibilities you mentioned, but also long term regulatory concerns and regulatory risks. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate hearing about that. Yeah. Cool. Okay, great. So that gives you a pretty good sense. So maybe you can add uh, Oracle solution to that. Oracle sessions. It seems like people generally have some background in stable coins, already aware of a bunch of the particular interesting things about that. So I will uh, do my best to hit um, as many of those topics as I can. Um, so in this talk, the thing that I want to do, amongst communicating some ideas about reserve, is to talk a little bit about what's happening in stable coins right now, why I think that's happening, and what I think uh, could be happening, and the potential that I think stable coins have. Um, it'll take a bit of preamble to build up to the uh, uh, sort of most interesting points. So give me about 20 or 30 minutes, and I promise it'll end up somewhere, somewhere cool. Um, <coughs> Current stable coin landscape. So, about a year ago, three recent college graduates wrote a pretty persuasive white paper. This was during sort of the peak of the uh, crypto bubble. They talked with Bain Capital, convinced them to invest ten million dollars at an eight hundred million valuation. I think this was in November. Or December of last year, and then went on to raise $133 million. So, if you aren't familiar with this story, this is what happened with Basis, um, sort of the, I would say, the, the, the company that most popularized the idea of the same point. Maybe Tether, it's a sort of toss between the two, depending on how it is. Um, this led to something of a gold rush into stable coins, where I think there's this idea that people latch onto, which is that, you know, one of the original ideas of cryptocurrency and blockchain was to create alternate forms of money. But Bitcoin is super unstable, all the different cryptocurrencies are super unstable, and if we create something stable, then that will sort of solve one of the primary hindrances to adoption. <clears throat> now, we're about a year on since that happened, and uh, how many of you are familiar with Gartner um, hype cycle graph. Okay, so briefly, the idea is essentially that any time that there's a new technology, it sort of follows a curve like this, in turn, where the, um, the y-axis is like hype, and the x-axis time, um, where it starts off, no one really knows about it. Then people go completely insane and say that it's going to solve every problem in the world. Then Everyone rushes in, funders, entrepreneurs, things like that. And then everyone sort of a little bit later realizes 
you know, this probably won't solve everything in the world, and it's also way harder than we thought. And then there's a sort of gradual development until you actually, technology matures, ideas mature, people realize what ideas are stupid, um, and then you end up with something useful. So, you know, like, if you're to grab different technologies, um, you might say, like, AI is maybe here, something like that. Um, cryptocurrency is probably here. Um, I would say stable coins are similarly sort of currently in what's called the um, uh, trough of um, delusion. What well, trough of delusion? Yeah. Um, where a year ago everyone was talking about decentralized stable coins. Where, you know, at, at basically every week you get a new white paper or some speculative design about how to create a stable currency, and they have all these different tokens and both mechanisms. Um, and people basically stopped. I think that's because um, decentralized economic designs are really difficult to get right. Um, and I think the thing that, you know, so for you know, starting in about November of last year, last until about June of this year, there are all of these people and all these projects rushing into the stablecoin industry. I think for a mixture of like, you know, by, so having talked to a lot of the funders in this space, by February, every single investor in crypto was already convinced that stablecoin going to be huge, maybe the most valuable thing in their um, A lot of that, I think, came from misconceptions about how it actually played out. But, um, so it's easy to get funding. I think maybe even more than that, the idea is like really simple, where it's like, make some dance with the dollar. Where for people that are sort of outside of crypto, trying to come in and find opportunities, find you know, companies that they can build. Um, it's a little bit easier to latch onto the idea of a stable coin than it is like a decentralized exchange or like figuring out how to do autonomous funds or something like that. Um, and so the result is that, you know, as of like a couple of weeks ago, I think there were like 95 stable coin companies around the world. Um, but interestingly, almost all of those have abandoned what I would call credible attempts to do decentralized. <clears throat> um, and again, I think this is because around June, July of this year, there was a temperament change amongst a lot of people, where people started realizing, wow, oh, this is really hard. We published all of these white papers, and they were really stupid. <laughs> um, I think, I think uh, for those of you that watch the industry, like, like Carbon is an interesting instance of this, where they published a white paper, and it just really like, didn't work. And then they redacted it, and then really something else, but didn't really say anything. And, um, and uh, another one is like basis has been sort of roughly silent since like June when they changed the name. Um, uh, so we're in this weird position then where almost everyone has switched to fiat coins. So if you read news about stable coins in the last couple months, basically all about Paxos and Gemini and Circle USD and competition amongst these, what's going to happen to Tether, but no one's really talking about the original thing that I think a lot of people got excited about, which is creating decentralized forms, alternate forms of stable coin, um, which I think the sort of the, the kernel of the cool idea in this space. Um, yeah. Why do you mention it Tethers in the same sentence? I'm confused. What? Tether. A tether. Oh, sorry. Yeah, tether. Um, <clears throat> where now I think, you know, it's just sort of leave you with a, a tweetable one-liner. Um, we we were promised a decentralized algorithmic uh, central bank, and instead we got you know, twenty slightly improved tethers, um, which is, I think you know a little bit disappointing relative to some of the hopes that people had. Wow. Um, I think, oh, and one other point that I think is worth mentioning in this space is that um, you don't build a decentralized stablecoin if you're following Y Combinator ideology where Y Combinator ideology says to identify your market, figure out exactly what the thing that that market wants, and then sort of build that to spec, roughly speaking. And for something like a decentralized stablecoin, you know, if you go to talk to the people that plausibly this would actually be valuable for, they won't, <laughs> they won't tell you to build a decentralized stablecoin. I think you can kind of differentiate technological opportunities into something like, you know, like um, Uber, where it's like, yeah, sort of like the market opportunity is really obvious. And I think there's other things where um, it's more like, almost like an ideology infuses the technological opportunity 
and then that ultimately manifests in something that can be profitable. Again, I think like currently Elon Musk is probably the best um, spokesperson for this approach. Um, sort of there. So, now we're here, November 2018, and what's the deal with decentralized stablecoins? <laughs> so, to answer that question, um, there's a model that I want to communicate about the relationship between technology and, like, what I call societal affordance spaces. So, um, so there's a way that I like to think about um, what's going to happen uh, in society as it unfolds over time, and in particular with regard to technological change and events. Which is basically that, um, um, so I often think in spatial modalities, and so the way I think about this is, there's this sort of underlying layer of reality, which is roughly dictates what is feasible given the current landscape. <clears throat> How quickly can you move from point A to point B? How quickly does information move from point A to point B? Um, how, uh, I guess this is a little bit different, but how long do people tend to pay attention to things? It's another interesting sort of like factor of the landscape. <laughs> and um, then I imagine society is sort of this layer that's built on top of that, where you have the reality and then people respond to the reality and sort of try to fit things to the opportunities given that landscape. <laughs> now, um, there's an interesting sort of consequence of this, which is that any time that technology changes, or sort of that underlying layer of reality changes, then society can then morph in response to that change. Um, you know, I think you can sort of like, think about it like, there's this like amorphous blob, and then you know, you get like this little piece that gets carved out. But now, you can sort of rush into this thing and a bunch of things change. I actually think about it more like, um, there's sort of like, all of these different like axes, and it's like very multi-dimensional, you can't really just like, Visualize it in a like three-dimensional plane or something because there are all these different axes that things exist on, and then you have this sort of like multi-planar thing that doesn't really fit in your mind very well. But I think that sort of more accurately captures the idea. Um, um, <clears throat> where so a few examples to illustrate this dynamic. So probably the most famous example of this is the invention invention slash popularization of the printing press um, and then the consequent Protestant Reformation, <clears throat> where, depending upon your opinions about all that, because it's very complicated, um, you can argue at least that the ability to very rapidly print and disseminate to, sorry, knowledge, ideas, um, then had a significant effect on the degree to which you're able to disseminate ideas. And then as a consequence, sorry, in very short order, get very large ideological changes that perhaps at least wouldn't have been in the ads case before. Um, other examples of this, uh, uh, so two, oh, yeah, so one example of this is um, on the topic of ideological dissemination. Um, when towns were founded in America during the sort of frontier period, often one of the first things that they would build is a church. And there's a question, why would they build a church? Well, you need some sort of local, physical manifestation of ideology in order to propagate and disseminate that ideology. Where if you didn't have a church, then there wouldn't be a place where sort of the, the ideology can live and grow, and so as a consequence, it would kind of wither and die, depending on sort of what exactly happens. Um, you know, if, if you imagine that being the case today, it's a little bit, you, know, it, you, you don't need to build a sort of man, physical manifestation the ideology because with the internet you have all these things that allow you to <coughs> connect with ideas and ideologies without having these sort of local representations. I sort of like to think about it that like you know a random town in the United States <coughs> in 1750 was probably like less connected than like I am to the Seychelles <coughs> in terms of like cost of getting there, 
like difficulty of transmission of information, all these things. Right? There's, there's just this sort of like oppressive um, isolation where uh, all these all these places just live independent of everywhere else, and you needed local um, representations of things for them to live. Um, one other example, because I, like, I really like thinking about this, is um, the effect that dating apps have on uh, general pe people's general social strategies, where um, a trend that I've noticed is that dating apps strongly incentivize um, uh, the degree to which you can capture some, someone's attention in a very, very brief amount of time, which then I think strongly incentivizes um, physical appearance and quippy one-liners, where then I think there's this sort of general social trend, at least in my opinion, in the United States, to sort of like hyper-optimize for like, like memes and physical attractiveness, um, at least amongst people that can successfully get one of those things. So it's another example of sort of the, the way that you get a technological change, and then all these subsequent societal changes come as a consequence of that. So um, how does this model apply to crypto? So, it's my opinion that um, a great way to find opportunities is to look for, um, to try to understand sort of the, the fundamentals of some technological change. And then, if you can understand the way that a technological change affects that underlying layer of reality, then you can kind of infer your way into what societal changes might or ought to result as a consequence of that, or maybe could but shouldn't sometimes. Um, and then what opportunities can you take give it? So then I think we're left with an interesting question, which is in what way does crypto slash blockchain tech change the sort of underlying layer of reality with regard to what is possible in society? So um, I think there are, depends how you cut it, two particular things that blockchain tech maybe not quite does right now, but at least directs your attention to the possibility of and the need for a bunch of further technical advance to achieve it by, by a certain ideas is there. Um, the first, and I think both, both are basically related to trust, where in general, for most of human civilization, the way that we'll coordinate large groups of people is via trust in central institutions. Um, you, know, you, can, you can see this manifest in the visual and name, the visual representation and names that financial institutions choose. You know, banks. Uh, you know, there, there, there are stories of. Um, uh, banks that would open branches in the frontier west of the United States, where they would build these really gaudy stone buildings in neo-Roman styles to convince people that they weren't going to just up and leave and run away with all the money, because why would you spend all this money to build this crazy building if you're going to steal all the money? Um, you know, and then you have, you know, the banks are often will hearken to nationalistic things like U.S. Bank, or you know, things that seem really trustworthy, like credential fidelity. Um, and it's because these institutions serve as the trust focal point, um, at least in financial services, where um, any time that two parties want to transact, there's this tricky problem where, uh, so that's it. let's say that I want to sell you my house. So yeah, I have deeds to my house and sort of the right to cede that house to you. You have a pile of cash that I probably want. Um, and so then imagine the circumstance where you come to my house and you sort of bring your bag of cash. And then you know, I say, like, I have a shotgun, give me your cash. And then you know, things don't go very well. And so because of that, you have entities like title insurance. And the thing that title insurance does is it you know, double checks that I actually own my house, double checks that Basil actually has the money. It does the transaction for us such that Basil and I don't ever need to be worried that we're going to screw the person. 
general idea of escrow services. Um, a neat thing that blockchain tech does, or has the potential to allow for, is the ability to execute transactions like that absent the intermediary. And this is just because it's possible to execute peer-to-peer -peer transactions in a way where you don't actually have to strongly trust the other party in the transaction. Similarly, I think, um, and this is sort of also related to trust, blockchains allow for um, the ability to make credible commitments in a new way. Right, so in monetary econ, one of the things, the to topic that's often talked about, talked about is basically the degree to which central banks can make credible commitments to policy. <clears throat> and also, this is a topic in governance in general, where um, uh, uh, the, the classic example of the problem in this space is um, floodplain insurance, <clears throat> where people, do, or, sorry, in general, you don't want people living in places that are really likely to flood, because you sort of will just like every 10 years lose all the housing stock in that place. But there's this tricky problem where people build houses in the floodplain. The government says, we're not going to come help you once this floods at some point in the next 10 years. But then it floods, and then it's all over the news, and you know, there's this sort of public outrage, and there are all these people that are crying for help standing on their roofs, and then there's this sort of like political necessity to help these people, um, despite the fact that you know, all else equally, you probably prefer to be able to credibly commit to not helping them, such that the people don't live there, such that you end up with sort of overall more efficient outcome. Um, so a cool thing that blockchain tech has the promise to allow companies, institutions, to do is to make stronger credible commitments in some cases. Um, so then, applying this set of ideas to money, A lot of monetary institutions, so, so I think monetary institutions are one of the um, most important institutions to have in the trust in a society. Because in that society, the ability to transact with other people and the ability to preserve wealth um, are sort of critical functions of the general function of that economy. There are generally ways that you can get around this, but um, having severely dysfunctional money in you know, an economy, um, just empirically speaking, is really terrible for the successful, the economic success of that country. I think a good example of this is um, Zimbabwe, where before Zimbabwe's currency crisis, Zimbabwe was kind of seen as the like shining example of modern economy. Where you know, their currency was the most widely transacted <coughs> currency in Africa for facilitation of transactions across countries. Um, they were seen as like this really promising case where this country might be a notable success case. And then they had all their currency crises and then the tensions which came. Um, so I think with um, the combination of blockchain tech applied to monetary institutions. There's this, what I think is a really neat idea that you can land on, which is basically, what if you could create new institutions that were able to more strongly maintain credible commitments to their policies? Um, I think the simplest and easiest thing that you can apply this to is something like a currency book, where, um, so in, in general, the way that I think about how you end up with stable currencies there's essentially two ways that you do it. This is probably not the right way to talk about this. But, um, <laughs> uh, one is you either you can either import the stability of something else. So this is like pegging your currency to some foreign currency. This is like having a gold standard currency, something like that. Um, the other thing that you can do is I, know, I think of as like directly stabilizing the currency, which is sort of like what the US dollar does, or like other major floating currencies around the world with doing things like inflation. Um, inflation. Um, so, I think exchange rate pegs slash currency ones are a really interesting um, potential application of crypto because it's simple. 
you know, the, the, the mechanisms that are executed by the currency work are pretty straightforward. Like, you can describe it in a paragraph and have that be pretty unintelligible. If you tried to describe the Federal Reserve in a paragraph, you wouldn't end up with anything useful. Um, uh, and further, it's, it's not that hard to conceive of writing something like that. So, um, oh, and, and sort of um, to uh, crystallize the like potential of this in your mind. Um, so, Argentina had a um, pegged currency for a while. Um, in fact, it was written into their constitution that forever and for all time, the Argentine peso will trade at this rate against the US dollar. <laughs> Um, then in 2001, um, that commitment was broken. Um, the Argentine government devalued their currency. Well, I don't know. They, I know they, they took about 75% of all bank deposits of the currency and devalued it by several fold. Um, basically, totally breaking their credible commitment to having a stable bank currency. Um, and in thinking about uh, sort of um, why events like that happen. It's important to have it be clear in your mind that um, intense inflation events like these aren't just like things that happen. I mean, when you read like Wikipedia articles about that, there's a way in which it's sort of like very written in like the passive tense, where you know, the, the, the currency inflated, but no particular person inflated the currency. <laughs> I think that this is a, a useful political tactic because it, you know, if you look at you know, roughly the 29 hyper, no, most notable hyperinflation events since the end of the 18th century, um, 25 of them are just directly the government needed money to you know, pay for their budget and took that from the currency <laughs> and kind of you know, took that into position, defended against the rest of the economy. Um, so the thing that we're talking about when we say institutions with credible commitments to stable currency <coughs> and prevention of you know, often catastrophic events like hyperinflation, like we're seeing in Venezuela right now. I think that we're doing is sort of um, conceiving of the idea of offering golden shackles to uh, societal institutions, which is basically, you know, they'll work better and they'll do the thing that you want if you can successfully constrain their action space. <laughs> and it seems like blockchain has the possibility of doing this. So I think this is um, this is kind of the idea that has flowed into what we're trying to do at Reserve in general, <clears throat> which is that um, and you'll notice I hedge because there's a lot of uncertainty in this space, but it seems to be the case that a mature version of blockchain tech, a mature version of decentralized governance, a mature version of a bunch of mechanism design components that are as yet definitely not fully worked out, and a more mature crypto ecosystem could allow for the creation of um, what I think could be institutions with notably different failure modes than the one that ones that exist currently, and potentially institutions with um, notably less uh, uh, less risky, depending upon exactly how it's set up. It's definitely worth noting that it's probably easier to create a blockchain currency that inevitably sort of like screws over economy and an economy than it is to create a blockchain currency that actually improves it a lot. So this is not sort of we call the challenge easy. But I think that you can see the potential for this given all of these sort of circumstantial features of what's happening. So then, there's a question, how do you create a decentralized currency? Um, so starting off with a few things that I often hear when I talk about stable coins is, so one, um, aren't stable coins impossible? Don't they violate basic economic principles? Um, so if you're talking about um, what's often referred to as algorithmic stable coins, um, like, Basis, because I think it's the most notable example. My answer is yes, you're correct. 
They do violate basic economic principles, and they probably will inevitably fail, maybe not in the sh very short run, because you can sort of artificially maintain things in the background, but as soon as they reach any sort of amount of scale, we should expect they will fail. Um, that said, we already have sort of decisive evidence that theoretically stable coins work um, in that tether has remained stable for a long time. It's interesting looking at the reasons for why tether has remained stable, just by the spike all the FUD around it. Um, but, you know, and then we have other examples of newer stable coins that are coming out that are, I think, uh, it's very straightforward to, to describe the core mechanism by which you should expect it to remain stable, which is that you have something worth a dollar over here, you then issue basically a um, asset over here, and then you say, if you have this, then you have the right to a dollar over here. And then insofar as the link between these two sides is maintained, then you can always expect the thing over here to be worth a dollar because the thing over here is not. And it's basically the way that all the you know, tether purportedly works is with all the um, other fiat coins over here. Um, and I think there's an interesting question, which is, is it possible to create a decentralized stable coin? Um, harder, but I think possible, and I'll sketch out directions that you can credibly pursue something like this. So, second concern after here is, don't currency pegs always break? Um, my answer to that is, currency pegs often break, um, but not always. Um, I think two good examples of currency pegs that haven't broken and I think have been maintained, sort of managed extremely well are Singapore and Hong Kong, um, both of which have maintained strong currency pegs for 40 odd years. Um, and uh, there, there's an idea worth communicating on the topic of don't all of currency pegs fail, which is um, uh, there's a line that I've heard often repeated amongst monetary economists, which is that every monetary crisis, every monetary crisis is fiscal in nature. Um, the meaning of which is that when a monetary crisis occurs, and I mentioned this earlier, there's a monetary crisis because the government is inflating the currency. Um, uh, it's often easy to forget that people in power are often quite incompetent. Um, and uh, the way that I imagine this playing out is like, you are um, the dictator of a small African nation. And there's this like, giant mountain of money over here that's held by your central bank. And you're in a civil war. And then you go to the bank and you're like, hey, can I use some of that giant mountain of money that you have there to like cause our country to not explode? And then the bankers might tell you, no, that's a really bad idea. Um, and you, know, you can sort of um, empathize with the situation where uh, there's a pile of money there. <laughs> and you really need money to spend for important things. Um, so, all of that said, um, the mechanism for maintaining a currency peg isn't that complicated, as long as the institution that's maintaining it actually has a strong credible commitment to maintain it, um, which is basically, you know, let's say I'm Denmark. Danish krona to be pegged to the euro. You know, anytime that someone wants more krona, if you give me a euro, so then you know, the central bank gets a euro. <clears throat> and then anytime that someone comes to them with seven and a half krona and says, I want a euro, and they give a euro. And so long as they don't ever sort of take those euros and do other things with them, um, then that system will just sort of mechanistically maintain itself. Another final thing that I'll often hear when talking about decentralized stable coins is aren't fiat coins enough? So we have this thing that successfully maintains a stable value, seems like they're getting better. Um, you know, isn't this sufficient for allowing the flourishing of the crypto ecosystem, for the development of dApps, for the facilitation of transactions for crypto traders? Uh, my answer is yeah. I think all of that is right. I think that for a while, the altcoins will be sufficient. Um, and um, 
on the regulatory side, my expectation is that there is a sort of looming ban hammer coming from FinCEN. Um, <laughs> uh, reason being that the correct interpretation of what something like um, you know, the Gemini dollar is, is it's a blockchain-based currency that maintains its value that you can send to anyone anywhere in the world, and they can send it to anyone anywhere in the world. So it's effectively decentralized peer to peer cash. Um, and if you're engaged in uh, shady financial dealings, this is an extraordinarily useful thing. General FinCEN does not want to allow things that enable shady financial things to flourish. Um, and so yeah, I think there will be a bit of a give and take in terms of how a lot of these systems are implemented with regard to regulatory compliance, but I think there's a sort of pretty intense overhang of um, uh, what's going to happen primarily because uh, you know, government institutions very appropriately move very slowly. Um, where you know you don't you don't want government institutions to pass <coughs> laws and intensely restrict or not restrict things. Um, you know, during like the crypto bubble. That's just like the wrong time because no one no one understands what's going to happen, no one understands what's valuable, everyone thinks that everything is amazing and no one knows what's bullshit. Um, and it takes a while for all of that to shake out and for sort of the, the new underlying reality to emerge and be apparent to all the people in the system. Um, so, so there's that. I think also, um, uh, I think a lot of the reason why blockchain and crypto is interesting is because of the ways that it changes these underlying fundamentals of how institutions are built, um, how we trust and transact with one another. And I think for achieving the, um, so to speak, we have this bubble, and you know, now we have blockchain that you know, allows this expansion. I think it's something like fiat coins capture a bunch. I think the majority of the interesting stuff exists in the space of taking advantage of sort of what I see as like the core feature of crypto, which is the way that changes these fundamentals. Um, and the fiat coins don't really do that. They do that a little bit. Um, and I think decentralized systems like this are challenging, but also much more. Um, okay, so that's concerns. Um, tenants. So, having thought about how to do stable, um, decentralized cryptocurrency design for like a year, um, there are a few pretty simple rules that you can follow where if you want to create something that might work, um, you should definitely follow these, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> so, one is you need people to believe that there is collateral backing. So notice, I phrase that sort of carefully, is that it isn't strictly the case that the collateral in fact has to be there all the time. Um, I think this is one of the ways in which Tether is so fascinating. Uh, it, the, the more that I've sort of learned about what's happening with Tether and the dynamics around it, the more it seems sort of um, brilliant to me on the part of Bitfinex if they're sort of like chaotic neutral money optimizers um, because of the way in which they were able to successfully create a overwhelming network effect for Tether, you know, lots of people are talking about those other things, Tether still has 97% of all stablecoin trading volume despite all the chaos for the last few months. Um, uh, and, you know, it's unclear exactly how much money Bitfinex makes from having Tether. Um, Having like two odd billion dollars that you can play with often results in having more than two odd billion dollars later. Um, so I suspect that they're doing that. Um, so, uh, but, so first is you need people to believe that there's power backing. Second is um, more phrases question: How much collateral backing do you need? This is a hard question. Um, we've spent weeks thinking about this. Um, and the result that we came to is that it seems like 
having strict knowledge of x percent will work and x percent won't work isn't really possible. Um, and if there are a lot of circumstantial features that will determine whether a system succeeds or fails. Um, that said, I think 20% collateral probably will basically certainly fail. 70% collateral will probably fail. 90% collateral, I don't know, it just still seems like it's going to fail uh, because of the sort of run on the bank dynamic, where basically, you know, if you have 70% collateral and you have open redeemability from your stable currency to your um, underlying asset, um, then, you know, if all of a sudden people are worried that, you know, they might not be able to redeem, then there'll be this run on the bank where everyone will try to redeem as quickly as possible, and then the last 30% of people that get there are too late, and then they lose all of them. <clears throat> so, I think it's dynamics like that, that especially in the short to medium run, you can expect will destroy any there will be under collateralized systems, this is why I, I've resulted on thinking that basically you need to have a credible commitment to 100% or more collateral um, in the like short to medium run. I think it's possible to dip below for periods of time, especially if you have sort of external commitments um, to loan you money or things like that. But in general, roughly aim for 100%. Um, and the final one, which I think um, fairly decisively constrains the design space for decentralized stable coins um, in the medium run is uh, it's either the case that your backing collateral has to itself be stably valued or you have to over collateralize and you must do one of these two things um, both have significant challenges associated with them. Um, for over collateralization, the problem is that you know, if you're going to issue a dollar for every dollar fifty a person gives you, you have to have some reason why they're giving you dollar fifty to only receive a dollar in return. <laughs> so you can pay for this through loans or something like that, but it's expensive and doesn't scale. <laughs> the only other possible way to do, do the over collateralization approach, I think, is something like what MikroDAO is doing. Um, for those of you that aren't super familiar with MikroDAO, um, their system is basically, uh, it allows you to take margin positions on assets where basically you post, I'd say, you know, $100 worth of ether, <laughs> post $150 worth of ether, we'll give you $100 worth of DAI. Um, and then you can sell that DAI, which is the stable coin, that DAI is now collateralized by ether that's locked up. And then you can sell that die for more ether. So now you've taken a $250 position on ether, just by not necessarily having all that $250. So it's a sort of um, allows you to take relatively small margin positions. Um, there are a bunch of problems with this, and there are reasons why I think if you're trying to create the the one true cryptocurrency, um, <clears throat> which is what Reserve is trying to do, is you know there's this promise of a decentralized currency that can allow everyone in the world to transact. Um, that was sort of a, a bunch of the original idea of Bitcoin. Um, that won't happen with Bitcoin. Um, and then probably can't even disagree with me. Won't happen with Bitcoin. Um, uh, but um, I don't think that the over collateralization approach is going to work. Um, and so then the other thing that you're left with, I think this is sort of the only way forward is um, backing with collateral that is itself stable. Um, now, of course, if you're familiar with crypto markets and crypto assets, there's an obvious problem with this, which is, well, one, all of the crypto assets are unstable, and two, they're all super poor labor on them, such that if you're trying to create sort of stable backing collateral using exclusively on-chain assets, then you're just going to fail. You can maybe do this by, like, putting together a basket of other stable coins and sort of having a meta coin. That's an idea that we, our team has talked about right now. Um, it seems like this is just strictly a worse product than <laughs> existing stable coin uh, because I think most people will treat a 20% loss as roughly the same as a 100% loss. Um, as um, so all of this results in um, uh, I think sort of 
simple things that you can follow. So a quick summary is um, you need people to lead in the collateral backing, you need to have roughly 100% collateral, and the collateral itself has to be stable. So then how can you do this in a decentralized fashion? So I'll now briefly explain reserve. And with all this preamble, it's actually pretty simple. Um, so every stable coin needs to do two things in order to succeed. These are to decrease the price. When the stable coin is above its target price, um, I'll note that here when I say stability, the thing that I'm talking about is a cryptocurrency that's pegged to some other currency, let's assume it's a US dollar, um, and so that serves as the target price market stability. There are many things to disagree about with that being stable, but um, we'll see that for now. Another thing you have to do is increase the price. So, um, so, how do you decrease the price of the thing? Well, sort of, economics one one said that if you increase the supply of some asset, then the price will tend to fall. So, in this system, what you do is you observe the trading price of um, the asset that you're trying to stabilize. So, in our system, the stable coin is called the reserve. So, anytime that the reserve is trading above its target price, you mint more of it until the price returns to its intended price. <laughs> um, there's a caveat that I'll mention um, to that, which is I think it's reasonable for someone to counter that. Isn't it the case that the price on something like a stable coin is extremely inelastic, such that um, you know, there might be a bunch of latent demand where if you just happen to print 100 million more, then it would still stay stable, but the, this isn't observed in a price increase? I think that might be the case, and I think something like that is plausible. Um, I think you can counteract that by having a sort of default acceleration of the minting rate, such that you're tending to increase the thing, and then you scale back any time that the price falls. Um, so I think there, there are interesting ways that you can solve that. But um, yeah. um, then there's a the question, how do you increase the price? Well, I left out something when I said decrease the price, which is um, when you decrease the price, you mint the new stable coins, and you sell it for and then you hold that collateral. And then when you want to increase the price, you spend that collateral to repurchase the stable coins. <laughs> so that you can also basically always maintain that um, convertibility between you know, one dollar of other stuff that everyone believes is worth a dollar and your stable coin, which you always want to repurchase. So there are a few challenges in this that I've looked at. Um, the first one is, where does the collateral come from? So as I mentioned, uh, all, um, basically all crypto assets are correlated and highly unstable. If you want to sort of have highly credible um, collateral, then you know, Ether is like roughly the worst choice <laughs> of like all financial assets. <laughs> well, that's true, that's true. Um, uh, so, I think it just is the case that um, implementation of this system as, as described in the very short run, like immediately, doesn't really work. Um, that said, I think there's this sort of interesting dilemma where it appears to be strongly the case that this is the only way to do it. Or at least it seems to need to be the case that this is the only way to do it. So then the thing that then you look for is, okay, well, will high quality collateral come to be? I think the answer to that is maybe, probably. It seems like it's pretty reasonable that it will become that. Um, and so there are a few reasons for that. Um, so uh, first is um, there are a large number of companies. Uh, well, um, okay. So the, the first. 
notable reason is that the trade under the trading systems backing most financial exchanges are sort of in a state where they are looking to be upgraded. Where a lot of the systems that are being used have been in place for quite a long time. Um, and I think there's a way that large infra technological infrastructure upgrades tend to happen, which is they don't necessarily pick what's sort of strictly the best thing or what is sort of like exclusively rendered technologically possible by new technologies. They'll pick the thing that's sort of in the uh, focal point. Where I think there's a bunch of ways in which I think trading systems will transition to blockchain-based trading systems, in part because the fundamentals are in fact better. Like, it's less expensive, the systems are sort of more robust, and uh, they don't have like similar failure points. Um, you don't have all the counterparty risk issues. You know, like Lehman Brothers is sort of the uh, word of terror whenever um, mainstream finance people talk about these trading systems. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think there's, there's both sort of, it's in it's the societal focal point right now, plus it has fundamentals. Plus I think there are a bunch of, um, so anytime that you have a large technological change, you need some on-ramp for how that technological change happens. Um, I think that the on-ramp for the trading of stable assets on blockchain systems is private securities. Um, so there are a bunch of companies that are working on, I will say so, briefly, private securities are basically um, uh, assets that are often so sold to sort of select people like the credit investors um, that are typically are extremely good. Um, so a good example of this is uh, investing in a venture capital uh, firm, where basically as an investor, you know, first off, there are a bunch of gaming factors for whether or not you're allowed to invest. And then once you invest, you're basically sort of in it for like eight years, um, just because being able to get out of investments like that is often very, very difficult. Um, so there's a general thing that I think is, again, interesting about crypto, which is that um, it allows for the notable automation of many programmable things. Um, and one of the things that this is being done for is the secondary trading of private securities. Um, so there are a bunch of companies like um, Polymath, or Securency, or Temple is doing this, um, where basically their business model is <clears throat> take these super illiquid private securities, like you know, special forms of bonds, or venture capital funds, you know, they're, they're the, probably the most well-known um, institution that's doing this is this venture, a uh, European venture capital firm called Spices, um, where basically what they're doing is they're um, allowing people to invest in this venture capital firm, and the interesting part is that uh, the assets that you purchase by investing are somewhat liquid, in that you can actually sell them there are secondary exchanges that intend to be trading these in a somewhat open fashion. Where historically, the reason why there hasn't haven't been strong secondary trading platforms for private securities is because um, uh, because of compliance issues. Um, where basically the number of regulations that you have to follow in order to successfully sell someone many of these assets is sorry, extreme, um, and there's often it's often very impractical to be able to. Uh, actually execute these transactions due to the way that the information is stored about these securities. Where, you know, for example, like getting a list of who owns these securities and how much they own can often cost like five hundred thousand dollars because it's stored in different sort of um, tracking systems of many many different institutions. Um, and so there's simple things like this that basically replacing this with uh, blockchain-based public ledgers really simply solves. Um, and so <clears throat> my current projection for what's going to happen is that um, I think there will be a bunch of private securities that start to be issued and traded. And these will actually serve as the initial most interesting form of collateral for blockchain-based systems. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, this will also serve as the way that major finance institutions sort of get familiar with blockchain-based systems. It's sort of like putting a foot in the water. Um, 
one company that I think is really interesting is called The Ocean, um, <clears throat> where basically an ex Goldman Sachs guy who's working with Goldman Sachs to have them do primary issuance of mortgage backed securities um, on the blockchain system. <clears throat> um, so, of course, this is somewhat speculative, but I think um, the trend seems to be that more stable collateral will come to be available over time, such that you can create robust collateralized systems like that. Um, a second notable challenge is um, um, uh, so when we talk about decentralization, um, there's a question like what that means. And, uh, uh, and it's a bit complicated to think about what the different types of decentralization are. The easiest way to think about it that I've found is basically you want to remove powers from particular entities. <laughs> and so basically when you decentralize something, you're shifting the locus of power from one actor or one entity to a different set of actors or entities. And you can sort of um, understand what the decentralization means um, by looking at who has power and who doesn't, and the way that that is different from normal institutions. Um, so I think there's a challenge with collateralized systems, which is that any time that you have some valuable collateral, there will be some party behind that collateral that sort of probably has some sort of legal entity, um, probably is based in a particular location, probably has some government that is overseeing that institution and has a bunch of power over it, where then you, know, you can imagine a circumstance where you do have a bunch of on-chain collateral, <coughs> but, um, uh, but you know, 70% of it is based in the US, such that in effect the US government has the ability to collapse your system anytime they want. Um, so I think that that is a very interesting challenge. Um, If you can't tell, much of the way that I'm framing this talk is basically trying to narrow the affordance space to make it such that despite the options available being painful, <laughs> they're also pretty much strictly necessary. Um, and I think this is an instance of that, where in order to create a robust, decentralized, collateralized system that can't be sort of crashed by, any, by an arbitrary actor, um, this will have to take into account the way in which that collateral is maintained and stored in the background. The way I think about this is you want sort of a very small amount of collateral stored in like most jurisdictions around the world, and you also want to allow that collateral to appreciate over time such that you have more than 100% backing against the um, stable currency. Um, so that's another challenge. The third challenge, um, <clears throat> I think I like to think of this as sort of the giant pink elephant in the room of crypto in general, which is decentralized governance, um, where uh, a system like this can't work without robust decentralized governance. Um, and insofar as you don't have dece robust decentralized governance, you basically need some central actor, which is basically going to be us, <laughs> um, you know, fixing but like zero day bug bugs when they come up. or tweaking parameters to you know, exactly when you'll execute a trade to make it such that you aren't being exploited by you know, algorithmic traders and things like that. <clears throat> um, and so then I think there's a, a general challenge of how can you design robust decentralized government systems and how can you make them robust to exploitation. Um, uh, an anonymous friend of mine um, uh, likes to describe this as uh, Any time that you're trying to create a decentralized governance system, you are inevitably subject to the full open world of politics. This is basically because however you set up your system, there's some way to influence that system. If there's no way to influence that system, then you, can, you can't take choices and make decisions. So there, you, there has to be some mechanism of influence. And insofar as there is a mechanism of influence, that can be exploited by any arbitrary actor. And so 
you both need the sort of object level layer of governance, which describes, you know, in our case, like, which assets do you pick to collateralize the system? <clears throat> but you also need the meta level of go governance, which is basically in what ways is governance failing, and how can we sort of systematically upgrade our governance system such that it's always a couple steps ahead of the relevant attack vectors that exist. Um, if that problem sounds outrageously difficult, that's because it is outrageously difficult. Um, I think because a mechanism designed like this in crypto is so hard, my anticipation is that if any of the interesting things are actually going to happen um, in, in the space of the creation of cool decentralized systems, <coughs> people need to get way better at mechanisms. Um, and I think, interestingly, this is an area in which there just like, aren't that many people <laughs> that think about this or are good at it. Uh, like, if you know anyone that is good at it, then I'll pay you like a thousand dollars to tell me who they are, uh, because they're very difficult to find. Um, so, uh, I've been talking for about an hour. Um, so I think there are a lot of questions that people have. I probably, how long does it take to get to Harvard from here? In In what way? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Five, five, yeah, ten minutes. Okay, then I brought. I have to run at like six point five. Um, but do you have more questions? So, um, as reserved bros, what are you going to do to have collateral for it? Because you're going to have to have one hundred percent collateral. Well, it's, it's safe, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> the simple answer is basically anytime that you mint reserve, you sell it for. You sell it for a dollar worth of other cloud, and then there's just a leftover problem of does that cloud maintain its value? Um, uh, there will be more information on this topic available in about eight minutes. <laughs> If I were to levy one critique against Migrado, um, I think it might be that they don't have something like a sufficient resolve to win. Um, where I think very often, uh, like it's easy to ma to maintain a sort of strong ideological front and lose. Um, and I think that happens very, very frequently in the history. Um, and you need to know when to compromise on ideology. Right. My expectation that I play the Make It Out project for it a bunch of years is I just made that they'll be interesting and maybe a profitable company. I also be very, very surprised if they got anywhere close to um, sort of achieving like the current stage. Um, because I don't think that they'll be able to scale or compete in the right ways. Um, and so uh, in the short run, I think um, doing things that allow you to compete and be in a position whereby you can later enact sort of more interesting ideas once they become easy. It's roughly the sort of strategic track. So I have a couple of questions. Um, one is like what incentive does an investor have to get into a stable coin? Mm -hmm. So like to get a bunch of stable coins that aren't yet worth anything, worth anything. Or and then also um, in your description of how to collateralize, you basically it seems like you want to have access to capital in like every corner of the world. Mm -hmm. um, don't you then take on like, if you believe fiat will continue to exist alongside uh, decentralized stable coins um, or cryptocurrencies more generally, like don't you then take on like exchange risk there and like worry about uh, a certain area collapsing, or I guess it's, it's just so decentralized that you don't have to worry about any specific area. How do you yeah. deal with that? Yeah, good question. Uh, sorry. What was your first question? First question, what incentive does like an investor have to get in on a stable right. coin? Yeah, so um, I think for most stable coins, the, uh, so a lot of different mechanisms are proposed. Um, and we've looked at a lot of different ones. <clears throat> Terra talks about um, transaction fees is the primary thing backing it. Um, and also the collateralizing mechanism. Um, 
other people talk about uh, senior age and assistants, basically you did some uh, printing. Um, I think the correct answer is appreciation of capitalizing assets, um, where you can create portfolios of assets that don't maintain sort of strict, perfect stability in the very short run, but the likelihood of you know a 20% drawdown from your starting position um, 30 years from now, assuming sort of like sort of uh, factoring out like risk of like societal collapse and nuclear war and things like that is like very very high. <clears throat> I think that's the correct direction. But basically, if a stable current stable um, cryptocurrency scales up a bunch, then we'll have a huge amount of collateral such that if you condition on reaching 10 billion in market cap of a stable coin, uh, then it's very easy to justify outrageous uh, valuations of early stage candidates. Uh, well, so, that so yeah, but let's say so. Let's say this goes all the way to like the ultimate vision of like you want to replace all money in the world. Sure. Then like you have a much you have like orders of magnitude larger than 10 billion, right? Like yeah. you talk about all like M1 and M2. Yeah. Then. Like you basically, yeah, you have to own a lot of stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I mean, I think with that you can, um, uh, yeah. So, okay, so this is getting to sort of what could the thing look like in the very, very long run. Um, so, uh, so in the scenario where a stable cryptocurrency replaces all of fiat, like literally, literally every single one. Um, the thing that you probably do is what the US dollar did, is just get rid of the oh. <laughs> um, I think there, there's, a, uh, there's a fun way that I like to think about this, which is um, in the definition of what collateral is. <clears throat> so collateral is basically, there's value back in the system such that it preserves a certain value. So I think there's a fun question you can ask, which is what is the collateral back in the US dollar? I think it's um, network effects. Or basically, you know, it's 1972, I think, Nixon suspends convertibility of the dollar into gold, and everyone's like, what happens next? And then they're just like, well, let's just keep going. <laughs> um, a little bit of a simplica simplification, but I think that's sort of like roughly what happened. I think in the scenario where you're in like the single world money, or something like that, could make sense. Um, I think there's a hard thing when talking about um, stable coins becoming the dominant form of like, money transaction, um, which is like, uh, like should that happen? Um, I don't know. That's a really, really complicated question. Um, <clears throat> very. I think there, there are like many things that you looked to that suggest that it probably shouldn't happen. According to some, the currency unification of the Eurozone was, for many, a very bad idea. Again, that's a complicated thing, and people in economics tend to not disagree about things. Um, but uh, you know, I think there are a lot of reasons to suspect that having a single world currency would be bad, and isn't the sort of thing that should be gone for. Um, my current anticipation is that blockchain-based currencies will have a role to play both inside and outside of government institutions. Um, you know, if you look at like the top agenda items for a lot of central banks around the world, um, one of the things that's on there is central bank digital currencies. Um, where that's particularly in the last like four months, um, there's been a bit of a tipping point on that, which everyone's talking about. And you know, like a bunch of central banks have already made what amounts to what seem like commitments to issuing things like this. Um, uh, most of them in China. Um, so <clears throat> that's it. I think my, my anticipation is that the important role that blockchain-based currencies want to play is in the developing world, um, and maybe something like a upgraded version of dollarization, um, or something like that, or the, allowing, the facilitation of like um, institutional bootstrapping. If you're the new head of the Zimbabwean Central Bank, um, it's really hard to make credible commitments. Uh, it's really difficult to uh, conduct effective monetary policy if you can't make credible commitments. Yeah. Are there like ethical issues?
issues around um, like the Western world and the developed world, basically creating a series of scenarios where um, either countries that were Commonwealths or were you know, colonies and stuff like that don't have the self-efficacy to have the economy that would then fuel relatively stable currencies, and then to have the young upstarts upset like. Um, I guess former colonizers slash uh, Western countries who come over on some like white knight bullshit and say, "Hey, we've come to fix the problem that our that we kind of like profited from." Um, like, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't want to spread out like, "Oh, what, what about like Sharia and stuff like that?" But like, is it kind of like fucked that we're focusing on building a solution for a problem that? To an extent, we are like either profiting from or responsible for, uh, and like instead of us like funding all these initiatives to fix other countries' problems that are kind of like our fault, should we be funding initiatives to give like kind of like teach people to fish yeah. so that they can just build their own economies based on whatever needs they see are fit, and kind of like we can turn around focus on other issues. Yeah, so I think that's definitely a like valid concern. Um, the way that I usually navigate um, problems in this space is basically um, try to understand what is in fact better and then cause the in fact better outcome to occur. <clears throat> now, I think there's, a, different, there's a, di a difficult task of sort of identifying and quantifying what better is. Um, but you know, I think in many cases, much of the reason why currencies fail is because of um, corrupted institutions. Um, and to the extent that you can solve that with systems like this, then at least in some respects, that's even better. Um, I think that the typical mistake that's made um, by like uh, Westerners with the like save the world or like save Africans syndrome um, is that they don't listen to the African helpful. Um, the probably best example of this is play pumps. Remember play pumps? <laughs> this is a great. Story. My, my mom runs an NGO, so um, uh, so I grew up sort of. <clears throat> And stuff. But play pumps were this uh, really sad story of um, so it was like I think this was the late two thousands and there's this issue where a lot of towns didn't have um, uh, wells and so the idea was to build wells in all these towns that didn't have wells so that people wouldn't have to walk as far to get um, water and then they had the further idea that well why don't we combine wells with children playground equipment. <laughs> and so the thing that, and th this is sort of like one of the most widely talked about efforts in the nonprofit space, where basically you built these merry-go-rounds that were attached to a well, such that basically the idea was children would play on the merry-go-round, and they'd have fun, and then in the process they would be pumping water, and it would be this really efficient system. Also, it turned out that um, uh, the merry-go-rounds were just really not fun because you're pumping water, and the thing that makes a merry-go-round fun is that it spins really fast. But if you're pumping water, then it'll sort of like spin and then stop. <laughs> and so then you have all of these horror stories. They, they installed like, oh, like dozens of these things. And then there's these photos of like dusty children like walking around <laughs> this merry-go-round, or, or like, like middle-aged women having this be the way that they're pumping water. And it was just like a like, total catastrophe. And like, it would have been so simple to realize that this was just a terrible idea if you did like one in the town and talked to the people about whether this would be nice or not. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> I think that, yeah, it was really bad. There's a great, some great write ups that I would recommend reading. Um, but I think that is basically anytime that you're trying to affect positive change in a place that you don't know much about, then, well, you need to fix the problem of not knowing much about it um, first before you should. So um, I kind of missed the part on how it 
becomes decentralized. Um, and the decentralized governance, and like, how does that all go from reserve and a handful of like millionaires, billionaires, like kind of holding all the the system and the structure and the organization to where this is somehow decentralized? Yeah. So I think the uh, points of decentralization. So I think that there are two relevant points of decentralization to focus on. One is um, the nature of the collateral back in the system, and then the second is the nature of the control of the system. So I think where then I think if you sort of achieve decentralization of those two components, then you've roughly achieved a decentralized system. Um, so I mean, yeah, I think so, but I, yeah. I'm not quite sure how it gets there. Yeah. <coughs> so I think on the collateral component, um, there are two primary ways that I think you can achieve decentralization. Um, one is, uh, um, so I think the way that I think about this is there's, um, right, so the way that you achieve this is basically you want it to be that no single actor or sort of like plausibly coordinated with single actors have the ability to crush the system. So, achieving that in a totally robust sense is very difficult. But there's a question of sort of how far along that access can we get. So I think the relevant things to pay attention to are, one, you want assets that preserve their value. And two is you want those assets to be manifest in the form of the game that's seized. Um, for the, I think, for the prevention of seizure of assets, um, one component is that it is more difficult to seize blockchain-based assets. Um, that's in my expectations that this will change over time as companies become more and more regulatory compliant. So then I think the thing that you want to do is um, diversify your backing collateral such that it's held in many, many different jurisdictions around the world in many different forms, um, such that the plausibility of seizure of a significant proportion of it becomes more and more difficult over time. And then a further component is that any time that you're holding assets like these, you ought to hope that those assets appreciate, such that over time, you'll have more and more backing collateral against um, the currency, such that there's a certain, you know, there's a, um, I think it has like, there's some threshold at any given point below which if you drop below that level of collateral, the system will collapse. And there's an arms race between um, uh, the nature of the collateral that you're holding and the um, amount of collateral that you have against how much could plausibly be seized and what the cutoff threshold point is. Um, and I think this can be further facilitated by um, other forms of collateral, other forms of value coming to an effect back systems besides just the assets backing, which is in the form of network effects, where I think that can sort of lower the um, amount of collateral threshold over time. Um, it takes a while for that component to work. Um, and uh, I think you know, I think a lot of people would sort of aptly critique that. I think is a, it's a critiquable component. That's that I think the same will basically hold for most decentralized systems. Um, you know, like if uh, you know, it seems to me at least to be the case that um, uh, the expectation that something like Bitcoin is robust to the manipulation of large central actors like the U.S. government and the Chinese government is a little bit foolhardy, um, and uh, that every attempt at a sort of like fully robust decentralized system will ultimately devolve to, to what degree is this attackable should some superpower wage total war against it. And you know, any time a superpower wage is total war against anything, the typical result is destruction. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, you know, passing the threshold of robust to superpower total war is, I think, a really intense threshold. And there are many thresholds below that that I think will be the more, more relevant ones in practice. Um, then on the decentralized governance side of things, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't get into that at all in this talk. Um, just wasn't the, 
focus on it. Um, but uh, that's a component that has to be worked out. Um, we're going to be releasing a paper on that probably in January or February, something like that. Um, and yeah, so um, a little bit too complicated to actually get into that. But, but I, I, I totally agree with the point that you can't have a decentralized system. I, um, maybe the one other part um, that like, maybe is implied, or that I'm just trying to get my head around the understanding. So when this collateral is exists and it's all over the world and it's different types of assets, there's some different kinds of management teams that are actually actively managing those assets. To like if these are shares and ownership in stocks or corporations or real estate, and, like so there's this collateral and then like it's all floating out there. But like who's actually yeah, so it's a decentralized part of it. Yeah, so um, our current design for this is so um, is our opinion that um, a coin, a token based voting systems, so basically um, like ownership of some amount of token connoting sorry, a proportional amount of voting rate, basically doesn't work because you're just subject to whoever has the most amount of money, and that's a really bad governance metric. Yeah. Um, so, it seems like the thing that you need to design is robust um, reputation systems. Um, so there's a question, how can you design a reputation system that is um, sorry, robust to corruption that also allocates reputation to the people who um, are both most aligned with the system and also most competent to execute the tasks that the system needs? Um, so I think this, so, Decentralized governance mechanism design is, I think, it's like in it's like pre-infancy right now, um, and this is going to be an area of very difficult long-term research for like years and decades. Um, uh, that said, our current sort of like short version of designs in this space is basically that you want a um, so you need a blockchain-based communication system. Um, where basically any component of your reputation system that isn't based on a decentralized framework is a vector for attack. So you can imagine having like some centralized forum on which you have this reputation system. Well, now the owner of the forum is this like central point of failure. So first, you need basically um, decentralized uh, blockchain, probably blockchain-based um, community organization systems. So something like a forum. Um, then there are a bunch of different components of governance that you need to have that work. So you need both the object level governance component, which is basically allocation of reputation to people that prove themselves to be skilled at portfolio management and aligned with the system. And you also need the meta governance, and basically um, uh, governance over to what degree is the system in fact achieving its intentions, um, calling out <coughs> things that, and calling out and rewarding activities that you want to reward and punishing activities that you want to punish. Um, uh, our current design of this as a, that um, uh, you have people uh, allocated funds from the overall collateral backing um, proportional to their reputation, um, such that to the extent that a person is trusted by the system, then will be allocated funds that they can make some sort of small percentage profit from on the um, appreciation of those assets in exchange for the contribution of their efforts. Um, of course, then you run into problems like you know, well, won't a person be incentivized to take the um, most risky position and then just sort of like exit attack the system once the economy fails or there's a long recession or something like that? Like, yep, that's definitely one of the hard problems. Um, incentivization of on the order of like 10 or 15 years, such that you have it sort of built around the boom and bust cycle of economies, is one of the harder problems in the area of creating uh, creating systems like this. Um, so, yeah, so, so I'd say it's very challenging area of research. But, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. So I, I might have missed it because my city was just announced a martial law, so I was a little distracted. And if you already said it, I'll just, there's enough people in the room I can ask them. Yeah. But I'm a little confused. Um, if they just come back to the United States, not to the rest of the world. When, um, the currency having difficulty, like in 2008 or whatever, mm -hmm. um, how uh, does a stable coin do anything different than whatever it's stable to? 
here is a, to the dollar. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good question. Um, So, in the system that I've described, um, not much <laughs> is the real answer. Um, I think the, uh, where you know, ultimately, if you're pegging to be a scholar, then you won't do any better than the US. Um, I think in the long run, it's interesting to think about ways that you can design systems that sort of um, are stable um, and don't do that by some sort of pegging mechanism. Um, I put that in the camp of hard, long-run research challenges. Sorry. <laughs> um, there are some interesting ideas in, in that space, such as like maybe the thing that you can do is like um, have a basket of like relatively monetary goods, um, you know, like oil and gold and things like that. Um, so let, let me just clarify. Maybe I, I miss, I'm not understanding it correctly. But what what's the point? Having stable coins that's going to fail at the same time as a monetary system it's attached to. Mm -hmm. So I think the point is that uh, roughly the same as like pegging and dollarization in the first place um, is basically you can import the stability of other assets into a system. Does that make sense? Where like like you know, they're they're sort of very large number of countries around the world that. I understand, but let's come back to this country. Oh, so, oh, so in the U.S., how does something like a stable coin help the U.S.? Like, oh. like how did, never mind the U.S., but how, like, if I live here, why would I bother with it? Yeah, so I think the answer is that it isn't that useful in this one. Um, except if you're doing special blockchain. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, 30. Yeah. Especially if you have some, um, as you described, some less wasted assets. Oh. Um, the front end is an issue of the failure, the agent is valid. Yeah, and we'll, we'll make this the, the last question just because it's already 6.44 and you have to head over. Yeah, it's a traffic if you need to get to a seven. Yeah. Um, so, I think the question one is that very liquid assets don't work. So it's like if you're collateralizing in the house, then that probably won't work. Um, you need somewhat liquid. I, th I think you need at least somewhat liquid assets. Um, you can imagine setting up ways that you can sort of bridge the gap between the liquidity of an asset and being able to provide sort of the funds when you need it. Um, so things in that space that we've been playing with are basically. Um, having like decentralized credit systems um, where basically a person who fronts funds that are needed in a very short run um, that you do, wouldn't want to access due to the liquidity of collateralizing assets, you can get by um, some sort of uh, small, uh, like, like um, uh, uh, low interest rate loan. Um, in the short run, I think those sorts of things would probably be set up sort of in non-on-chain settings. Um, uh, there, there's a thing in creating successful decentralized systems, practically speaking, which is that anytime that you decentralize something, the thing that you're doing is you're actually seeding power and control of that thing. Which means that your confidence in that thing being effective and successful for a very long period of time has to be very high. Um, and so I think anytime that you're trying to create decentralized systems like this, you want to sort of basically always start with the functional centralized version and then slowly decentralize components of it as you become actually confident both in that system working and also in the governance process for its update working. Um, and so I think about the illiquidity of assets as sort of following that trend. Where in the short run, you can collateralize with the illiquid assets as far as you can people that can sort of Bridge here in the grid, yeah. um, and that that isn't that hard to do off chain. And designing a successful decentralized version of that is challenging, um, as are all the Okay. All right. Thank you for for coming to speak. <laughs>